Thank you. Uh, Eating is a resident physician in internal medicine, primary care at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Eating earned her bachelor's degree in economics, magna cum laude, and a certificate in health policy from Harvard University. She received her MD from Duke and is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Doris Duke Clinical Research Fellowship from the University of Pennsylvania, the Diane Becker Award for Clinical Epidemiology Research from Johns Hopkins University, and the President's Prize for Value-Based Healthcare from Partners Healthcare. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm really delighted to tell you about our experience in teletriage for first responders and emergency departments. So, who here, by a raise of hands, has ever ridden in an ambulance, either as a patient or as a loved one? Actually, quite a lot of you guys. Um, and I think if for anybody who has ever been in that situation, you know how scary it could be. In fact, I hope that all of you uh, think that when you arrive at the hospital, the hospital is completely prepared and is expecting your arrival. They have the right team in place, the right nurses in place, and they know to expect you and get the right treatment, of course, especially if you were having a life-threatening disease, a heart attack, a stroke, or just was in a, a serious accident. Across the United States, this is what we have in terms of standard of care. So radios remain the standard of care for early notification from ambulance to hospitals across the US. Some places use a direct dial cell phone, but across generally this is uh, still what we're working with. At the Brigham Women's Hospital, which is a Harvard affiliated hospital, part of the Partners ACO, this is what our triage command desk looks like. It kind of looks like it came out of the 1980s. And um, you can see multiple telephones. They are radio telephones, other telephones, multiple lines. And in my ED, my nurses are constantly being bombarded by phone calls. They're not coming in in the most acuity or, or most important phone calls first. They kind of come in first call, first served. That might mean that sometimes when my nurse is on the phone with some little old lady who stubbed her toe, there's a patient in an ambulance uh, with a heart attack that's waiting on hold. And, and when those cases happen, cause some major problems. The other big challenge with the current system as it stands is that paramedics are actually really well equipped with amazing devices in their trucks. They're constantly innovating, they're collecting vital information, including vital signs, uh, telemetry, EKGs. None of that uh, can get transmitted unless you buy standalone systems. Instead, what I get mostly is something more like this. It's written on a few scraps of paper, the nurse just took it down, wrote it down, tells me that I have a patient pretty sick, got a few treatments, stable, will be here in five minutes as estimated by the EMT. What I don't get is something more like this. I don't have any patient identifying information, don't have any photos of, let's say, uh, neurological symptoms or uh, photos of a trauma, and there's no other ability to get an EKG unless my hospital pays for it, and my hospital actually does not pay for that service. And in a busy emergency room, it can look like this. It's actually chaotic. And when paramedics tell me they come in and they have a whole team of people waiting to hand off the patient of a really sick case, uh, it's very difficult to figure out who you're supposed to talk to, uh, what information needs to be passed on, and who you're going to give that EKG strip to. But probably most frustratingly, we see delays. Uh, delays in getting the right team in place, delays in getting the OR or the cath lab activated in time. And it's not because people didn't want to do the right thing. It's really because, you know, for that paramedic, the radio was all she had. And for our ED, that radio, a few seconds of what she gave, was probably the best that we could get. In fact, across the country, 18% of all patients who come into the ambulance uh, via ambulance experience an EMS to ED handoff delay greater than 30 minutes. Um, and for really sick patients, you can imagine that could have uh, dire outcomes. And that's uh, shown through because in the Joint Commission, they've come out and said that failures in communication it remains a leading cause for sentinel events and delays in treatment in emergency rooms. Generally, when there's a break in care, especially our handoff required for a sick patient, things can be very dicey. So to just to recap our current situation that I see when I admit a patient to the ED, is that currently the radios or phone calls that come in, they're time consuming, not only for the EMS staff to be on hold or to dial in, but for our nurses um, and from the clinicians as well. There's no ability to get photos, EKGs, or patient identifiers reliably. 
and ultimately it can result in delays in treatment for some patients and false activations of cath labs and its code strokes and others. It's been quite frustrating. So what we set out to do was to design a proof of concept implementation study of a novel cloud-based teletriage system for community paramedics and uh, ED providers at a level two trauma, cardiac, and stroke center. Um, this is the fifth busiest emergency room in all of Massachusetts, seeing 90,000 visits a year. So we deployed a novel pre-hospital notification system called Triage, which was developed in Boston, Massachusetts by one of my teams. The Triage smartphone app um, is, enables EMS to send photos, videos, EKGs, and structured clinical data. Um, the Triage web dashboard is able to allow any nurse, physician, consultant to see the information on the hospital side in real time. And we collected case use data prospectively over a three month pilot. So this is how teletriage worked um, in this pilot. EMS used the smartphone app to instantly collect and send data over a HIPAA compliant protocol. The ED was able to use the web dashboard to streamline their triage process with the goal of accelerating patient timelines for patients with heart attacks, with strokes and trauma. The main goal of all of this was to make sure that we delivered the right care for the right data for the right patient at exactly the right time. This is some screenshots of what the app looked like for EMS. Generally, you see very big buttons, a very simple interface. They're able to take a photo, photos of IDs, EKGs, audio memos, and videos. So for example, if you were evaluating a slurred speech or a patient with stroke symptoms, you could easily record that. Um, they were able to quickly select a chief complaint in the second menu, and then they were able to identify uh, um, patient and clinical metrics. This is the dashboard and how it appeared for the ED. So um, remember that in my ED, we have those telephones and kind of nurses taking down notes on paper. This is what they got instead. Um, they had a dashboard on one of their computers. They saw here, instead of having to take radio calls, they just saw that the next 15 minutes, they have four ambulances that are about to come. In fact, one just arrived um, and two more are on the way. You can see a GPS tagged estimate times of arrival. There's a snapshot of all the cases. And if you click on any of the cases, you see a more detailed screen. Everything that is done in the app is timestamped, so the ED staff can really get a sense of following the live current events of what's happening. And if there's any question about what happened when, they can always go back and track it. In the ED, if they were, uh, if this was a code stroke and they want to activate the neurologist or FYI the neurologist, because it's a web-based system, anybody across the VPN or hospital network was able to see this on their phone, iPod, or, or laptop, uh, including the you know, surgeons in the OR who are thinking about scrubbing out for uh, a level one trauma. So we trained 12 paramedics and the ED command center staff who were uh, using the dashboard. We also worked with three ambulance companies to use uh, this platform and got them on board and fully trained. In total, the three month process, there's 121 patient transports that were uh, done uh, using this platform. There was a 99.9% .9 uptime of the entire system, which was really uh, one of the things we wanted to make sure to test and see. Of the 121 cases, we saw like, you know, what was the breakdown of of cases, you know, were they just sending routine calls? Were they good scattering? We actually saw that it was a pretty good mix of cases. So 18, I'm sorry, 16 percent of all cases were considered acute. These were we call priority ones: your heart attacks, your strokes, your major traumas. 38 percent were urgent, kind of similar. They're sick; they should be seen soon, but not in an emergency. And then 46 percent of the remainder were considered priority threes, which are your routine cases and regular transports, and no big deals. We also looked at how, how are they using the app? Were they using the different functions? How frequently were they using it um, in, in the real life cases? And we saw that generally they included chief complaints and clinical tags for almost all the cases. So paramedics were really using the structured data to send over cases. Keep in mind that we require nothing. There is no, the app does not force you to do any of this. It's completely voluntary. So what the paramedics <coughs> chose to send was what they wanted to send. Uh, 21 EKGs were sent, representing 7% of all cases, the 53 photos representing 42% of all cases, and then 61 voice memos were sent, representing 51% of all cases. But more importantly, I think what we learned was that we talked and debriefed for the paramedics and saw what they did. 
we realized that they were a lot smarter than all of us and they figured out how to use the system best. And one of the things that they started doing was actually taking pictures of monitors because rather than saying vital sign stable or reporting any of this, it was easier for them for a stable patient just to snap a photo and, and send it over. Um, and we realized that they could tell us about the heart rate, the O2 sat, a blood pressure all on one screen plus a three beat EKG. They also took excellent photos of EKGs. Our, our software is optimized for EKG sending. Um, this is an example of a real uh, uh, EKG. All of these are actually from real patient cases sent over. Um, we just have all the protected health information redacted. And then uh, they even started sending over driver's license, patient identifiers. And when the hospital actually got this from their sending, their patient access department, which is the registration department, was able to pre-register those patients, which meant that they were able to print out a wristband before arrival. So when the gurney comes, when the ambulance rolls through at the registration line, they confirm, you know, are you John Doe? They were able to confirm it, and they go directly to a room with a nurse assigned already. And that was super helpful in facilitating uh, transports where there's no need to further wait in line when the ambulance gets here for another registration process. Uh, other things that we learned were it was super helpful to take a picture of a medication list. You know, to this patient who has 14 medications at home has a lot of comorbidities. To list out the 12 comorbidities he had would take a long time. No paramedic has time to do that. But giving me as a clinician a snapshot that this person is on blood thinners, plenty of heart meds, immediately gives me a sense of if this person's really sick, this person's probably got a lot of other things going on and I should pay attention. If this person's on blood thinners and I'm thinking about giving treatment for a stroke, I also need a little bit more backup to figure out what we're going to try to do. So what we learned, first that paramedics really uh, were easily trained on the app. We trained one super user who ultimately trained all other users within any ambulance company. So training from our standpoint was fairly simple. The ED staff found that the dashboard was faster and easier to use than the radio triage system that they had because they didn't really have to write notes down anymore. They didn't have to play the telephone game of a nurse calling a uh, ED physician and the ED physician calling a cardiologist. Uh, people could just say, take a look at case one coming in. And we really wanted to uh, see that the system was reliable, had high fidelity. We saw that we could use a digital notification system capable of 24 hour seven uh, reliability. And finally, we were able to show that teletriage eliminated the need for radios from almost all low acuity cases. And generally that was a major cut in the radio traffic. There are, I think, several important opportunities that uh, remain um, and from our experience that we really discovered. First is that there's a real opportunity here to reduce the burden of radio calls on hospitals and governmental agencies. I didn't mention this, but radios are, are, help, are, are um, operated by uh, the governments on the frequencies. They have to use operators to connect a radio call to a hospital. Um, and in Boston, there are only two frequencies by which medical control relies on. You can imagine there's 24 hospitals, 70 some ambulance services, and all going through two radio frequencies. This is incredibly burdensome to the state um, and the local resources, and this was a way to actually reduce some of that burden. Digital platforms also are capable of instant situational awareness. You know, the triage system was able to show immediately on a map where all of your ambulances are, where they're coming from, where they're going, what GPS, what acuity, and currently this government is using radios to do all that manually. This allowed them to have instant situa situational awareness, especially for say a mass casualty incident. They were able to much better sense how many uh, cases they need to send and how many, you know, how many traumas to send to at hospital A versus hospital B. And lastly, I think there's a real opportunity when you're able to send rich clinical data beyond just a radio report to um, expand care coordination and to improve medical outcomes for medical emergencies where early activation of complex teams are really important. These are for heart attacks, for strokes, and for trauma. So I, I just want to leave you with this one tidbit, which is that as I learned through my training program about this, that radios have been the standard of communication from ambulance to hospital since World War I. That was the first time that radios were put into ambulances, and this is still what we're using across the country. I think it's time that we change that. I want to thank a few people, especially the people at South Shore Hospital who helped make this happen, the folks at Triage, my hospital, the Brigham Women's Center, and also the